So uh, when I was invited to come in and uh, participate in the Books Long and Tesh Festival, I thought, you, you know, what, what connection could I offer? And it, it, it jumped in, uh, to my head pretty immediately that <coughs> New Iberia has a remarkable history uh, in the development of what we are now enjoying in terms of Cajun and Creole music and, and uh, <coughs> it, it, uh, a, a music scene that is uh, vital, uh, creative, energetic, uh, to the shock of lots of people, uh, because back in 1974, when we put on the first uh, Cajun, music, Cajun Creole Music Festival uh, concert, it was a concert, evening concert, uh, in 19, uh, uh, March 26th, not, not all that long ago, uh, in 1974, we, uh <coughs> in Lafayette's Blackham Coliseum, we had no idea who cared. We had no idea if anybody would come. We had no idea if the musicians we invited would come. Uh, it, back then, Cajun and Creole music was the music of old people, you know, uh, it was the older generation, and it, we thought that, but what we, what I had not factored in when we were thinking about, and it, you, believe me, we had high hopes. We were dreaming big. We were hoping, hoping the place would uh, have enough people so that it didn't look too empty. <coughs> um, Blackham Coliseum had a seating capacity of 8,400 people, and well over 12,000 people came that night. Why? I have no idea, and I was I was twenty three. They they turned the <laughs> they turned the production of this experimental concert over to a twenty three year old kid. What were they thinking? I have no idea. I still don't understand it. But <coughs> what we, what happened was what we hadn't factored in was the fa the the fact that in nineteen seventy four. All of the country, in fact, a lot of the world, was living uh, what came to be called sort of a counterculture revolution, you know, of people reconsidering what was important. It led to the hippie movement. It led to, it led to the beat generation. It led to rock and roll. It, re it led to the reemergence of jazz and blues and R&B. It led to the Newport Folk Festival, the, the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival. It led to all sorts of expressions uh, <coughs> musical, artistic, cultural, social, uh, and, and otherwise, uh, of uh, a generation that was thinking, you know, uh, we don't want to get washed out. We don't want to get washed out in some sort of generic, gray out American culture. We want to preserve some distinction. We want to be ourselves. We want to be able to be able to be proud of to be ourselves. And <coughs> if if you take a look, I don't. I didn't bring any. Today, but if you take a look at the um, the uh, photographs from that 1974 concert at Blackham Coliseum, there were lots of uh, you know grandmas and grandpas, but there were lots of moms and dads, and there were lots of kids, and there were lots of college students and high school students, and people with long hair and beards, and I mean it was a, it was the most amazing moment, uh, one of the most amazing moments of my life, uh, to see that people were indeed interested in what was our own. That moment <coughs> was largely uh, influenced by uh, something that happened here in New Iberia in 1934. Alan Lomax and his father, John, were making their way through America, m a lot of the South, Appalachians and South, and they were originally from Texas, but they were working for the Library of Congress in Washington, and they were traveling around uh, <coughs> the country recording, 1934, what was going on? The Great Depression. And there were several WPA projects, work project of administration projects, you know, building roads and dams and, uh, but there were, uh, there were other kinds of WA, WPA projects, uh, sending uh, f um, historians and folklorists to go out and do oral interviews. Uh, to capture the history that was disappearing in the hit, you know, in the memories of people who were old then. <coughs> uh, and uh, 
one of the things that they did was they sent Alan and John Lomax out to record what the country sounded like, not in commercial studios, not in commercial record studios, because records had just you know, been invented and were getting popular back in the teens. Uh, and in fact, uh, in fact, Louisiana French music had already been commercially recorded in 1928. Joe Falco and his wife Cleoma uh, recorded Alonso à Lafayette. So <coughs> uh, the commercial side of things was one side, but th they sent Alan and John Lomax out to record what the rest of the story was, what the rest of America sounded like. And they came through this area, as you can see on the map, uh, they, were tra they were obviously tra traveling Highway 90. Before I-10, that, that was the way, right? And uh, <coughs> in fact, when I-10's blocked, it's still the way, right? Uh, and uh, they, they were traveling I-90, uh, they, they went through um, uh, New Iberia, they came through Iberia first, and then they jogged off to St. Martinville and St. John's Plantation, and then they got, they went uh, on 14 to Erath and Kaplan, and then made their way up to Crowley and Jennings and Lake Arthur, and they were recording people in all these places, but th one of the first places they landed was here, and uh, <coughs> they were traveling around with a, uh, with a, about a 350 pound recording machine. I had, in early presentations on the Lomax uh, field work project, I had described it as portable. And uh, Alan Lomax, who was still alive uh, in w back in the 1980s when I met him, uh, he was an 18 year old kid uh, helping his dad record these, but he said, portable might not have been the right word, it was movable. It was movable, but took a lot of effort. And so they, what they did was they put it in the back of their car in the trunk. And a lot of the places they were recording uh, didn't have electricity. It was before REA reached them. So uh, they were running their recording machine <coughs> uh, off of the car that was idling nearby. And they ran cables and mics. And this recording machine uh, is kind of a, uh, <coughs> it, the, the, the recordings it made were not all that great. I mean, you know, we don't, we, we don't have, we didn't have, you know, stereo recordings and the, and the high fidelity st ability that uh, recording machines have today. But, but they, what they did was they etched, they etched grooves in, a, in an aluminum disc which looked a whole lot like uh, a vinyl, a vinyl record looks today, those little grooves that go around. And, and it wasn't very high fidelity, but it, because it was etched in aluminum discs, it didn't tarnish, it didn't rust, it didn't deteriorate in any way. And so what they sounded like in 1974, right after they made them, is exactly what they sound like today. And <coughs> they made uh, several hundred uh, recordings in this area. This is John Lomax recording uh, ballad singers in uh, Avery Island and uh, nearby White Oak and here in New Iberia. And as you can see, they were recording Creole music, uh, Creole singers as well as, uh, as uh, Cajun singers. And th this is a <coughs> shot of a typical uh, recording session uh, out in the yard. Uh, this is the, that, that, engraving machine that they had in the back of the car. <coughs> and all the, the, the fact that Lomax and his father uh, recorded this music in 1934, but they were absolutely stunned, stunned to find such a rich, lyrical, musical heritage here in South Louisiana. <coughs> and they took all their recordings and, and put them in the Library of Congress and that would have been it, except that uh, Allen was quite the activist, and he continued to be very active in trying to promote uh, <coughs> resistance to what I was describing, this sort of gray out, this sort of you know wash out uh, process that was happening in America. And he, uh, they, f they felt like uh, the media was contributing to that too. You know, like it, we were becoming a, a television generation, a radio generation. We were, we were c all the culture we were consuming. 
uh, was coming over uh, the airwaves from somewhere else. So he, they became interested in encouraging people to celebrate their own culture. In 1950, in 19, uh, yeah, in the 1950s, he suggested to Harry Oster that he come back to Louisiana and see if there was anything left. And Harry Oster made some pivotal recordings then. In the 1960s, he, sent, uh, he had Ralph Rensler come down to <coughs> uh, the area to see if there was anything left. And Ralph Rensler uh, made, so he was working for the Newport Folk Festival, the same folk festival that that presented Joan Baez and Bob Dylan and Buffy and Peter Paul and Mary and a lot of big folk uh, names in America. Uh, <coughs> Ralph Rinsler came down to Louisiana and uh, his visit resulted in the invitation of the first ba uh, group of musicians from here to go to play at Newport in 1964. Uh, Gladys Thibodeau, Vinus Lejeune, and Dewey Balfa. And I don't know if any of you recognize one of those names, Dewey Balfa came back an absolute missionary uh, trying to figure out how we could uh, preserve what we had. And Dewey's, from 1964 to 1974, worked really hard to try to get people here to appreciate our own culture. And in 1974, Dewey and Ralph Rinsler, because of a Alan Lomax, <coughs> came down to Louisiana and helped us uh, set up and, and launch uh, Festival Zacadien Creole. And this is a few years later, Dennis McGee uh, is performing, becoming a cultural hero. He's a 90 year old man who became a cultural hero because of all of this effort. And It was a, a, an, am an amazing moment. Uh, <coughs> caused it. Now, when I found out from Alan about these recordings that were in the Library of Congress, I said, they don't need, they, that's fine that they're in the Library of Congress, but they need to be here. We need to have access to them here to know what was what, where all this came from back in 1934. There was no other way to get it. So Alan said, absolutely, and he, call, he, je, he caused a copy of everything they recorded in 1934 to be sent back here to Louisiana <coughs> uh, to, to be placed at the university uh, in our archives. When I sat down at that tape record, uh, I don't know if you, a lot of young people here today, you never, you never, have you ever heard of uh, tape, like a, a seven inch reel tape, that's what we used to <laughs> record stuff on. They sent 11 boxes of, of 11 inch reel tape and I put it on the tape machine. I was with Michael Doucet, some of you may recognize him as the leader of Beausoleil, he's an old friend of mine. <coughs> we sat that at the tape recorder to listen to this stuff for the first time ever, the first time we were gonna have a chance to hear it. And I, I pushed the play button and heard something that was recorded here in New Iberia, in fact. I'll play it for you in a minute. And it was a jury, a Creole jury song about an Italian guy lying in a ditch, sick from eating rotten bananas. I know. And then his heart was broken for some reason. That had something to do with a breakup. And then he saying a phrase that turned both of our heads. He said, les aricos pas salé. I thought, whoa, wait a minute. We thought that was first recorded in the 1950s or 60s with Clifton Chenier and all of that generation. Here it was in 1934 in New Iberia. The first recorded, the first recorded use of that expression, les aricos o pasale, was from a guy named Wilbur Charles right here in New Iberia. And I pushed the stop button and I turned to Michael Doucet and I said, we're gonna have to rethink everything we thought we knew about, about our music, where we come from, where it comes from, what it, what it, what's in it. <coughs> and when I got those recordings, I thought, 
it's good to bring them back home to the University in Lafayette, but it would be even more important to go the next step. And so I started excerpting some of these performances that I, I was hearing uh, from certain clusters, family clusters or friends that sang together, uh, and I would try to track them down. And one of the first ones I tried to track down was, uh, well, this was one of them, Lannis Vincent and uh, Sidney Richard, his cousin, who had sung for Lomaxes and Kaplan. And I brought him all the way back, and, and he, he said, oh, my God, I remember that. We sang in a rice mill shoot in 1934 for this guy. I never saw him again, never thought I'd ever hear about this again. And, uh, but one of the most amazing stories about bringing this stuff all the way back home was with the Hofpower family uh, here in New Iberia. <coughs> this is uh, Julian Hofpower, the patriarch of the family. They lived on Hopkins Street, right over there by the railroad tracks. And uh, he had some daughters, a bunch of daughters who all sang family songs. Lomax was driving down, down the street here in New Iberia, and he heard some girls playing outside singing, I guess they were jump rope rhymes, or I don't know, play, they were playing, then they, they were singing, and he stopped and he asked if he could record them, and they said sure. So he, he recorded a few songs, and then finally one of the, one of the girls, uh, Elita Hoffpower, <coughs> um, this is, uh, let's see if I can find her. She was a young girl. She was, I think, 15, 15 or 16. She said, Mr., you're, you're wasting all of that recording stuff on us. You need to hear the real singer in the family. And who, he said, who's that? And he said, our father, Julian. So he waited and recorded Julian that afternoon. Some of the most amazing l French ballads and songs ever recorded in North America. So <coughs> I had the Hofpower family stuff. Uh, and I called in New Iberia to see if there must be some Hoffpowers still in town, and I found Tim. Any of y'all know Tim Hoffpower? He was a, an eye doctor. Uh, he may still be. I, I found him, and he said, yeah, that's my family. Uh, uh, I said, well, I got this stuff that was recorded in 1934, uh, and he, uh, I started naming them. He said, oh my, those are my aunts, and my, that's my grandfather. I said, well, yeah, I have, I have a cassette for y'all if y'all want it. And he said, sure, I'll organize a family, I'll organize a family meeting, and you can come to my house and meet everybody at once. <coughs> so I, I went and played this cassette for them, and uh, <coughs> of course, you know, you can imagine there wasn't a dry eye in the house. People were very emotionally moved to hear beloved voices singing family songs, treasures, that they had not heard in decades. Young, you know, Elita Hofpower uh, died rather young. Uh, <coughs> and uh, so they hadn't heard some of those voices in many years. Uh, 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 Julian had passed away as well. We were sitting, standing in his living room listening to this stuff, and I was happened to be standing next to uh, a young woman who had tears coming down her cheeks, and I said, it's really an emotional moment, isn't it? And she said, it is. She said, that's my mother, and I never got to hear her sing. This is the first time I hear her voice, and the family's always talked about what a beautiful voice she had and what a singer she was. Well, I, I can, as y'all can imagine, I about collapsed at that point. I was never so happy to have been a folklorist in my life. Anyway, uh <coughs> just to give you a, an idea, of uh, of this uh, New Iberia co connection, the Hofpower family also recorded uh, Davus Berard and uh, Luke Ebert and a few other people here in town. Uh, <coughs> uh, Luni da Como. Uh, these are some of the uh, the uh, jury singers. Anyway, uh, that'll give you an idea of. Uh, of what we're, uh, of the some of the people that I'm talking about. And now I'd like to, I'd like to get you to hear them. Uh, this, I mentioned Elita Hofpower. Uh, this is her. Let's see, 
would have been her. beautiful song that we traced back to the French Middle Ages uh, about a shepherdess. Uh, now, that's really, it's nice that we have that. It's, a, it's an immense, it's an immense uh, <coughs> collection of information about our past, about our, our culture, about the music that we in inherited from our French uh, ancestry, but, but there it is in the archives. So, so what? I mean, how many people are going to listen to this on the radio? Belle Bergère, jolie Bergère, ce quoi vous faites dedans ces bois? Realistically, not many. However, when we got this, all these uh, early recordings, it was it was my firm intention that this archive not be a morgue to house dead bodies that it be instead a recycling plant to inspire new creation based on the past so we started letting contemporary musicians into the archives and encouraging them to listen to them and this happened tout un beau soir en me promenant autour de long du petit bois charmant. Tout un beau soir en me promenant autour de long du petit bois charmant. Now people will listen to that on the radio because it's become new again. And so a, uh, a lot of these Lomax recorders, recordings from right here in New Iberia, and Iberia Parish, uh, ended up getting recycled to become songs on set lists and, and recordings by the c entire uh, contemporary Louisiana French Cajun and Creole musical community. I want to play you the song that I, uh, that I first heard. Um, let me see if I can find it another way. <coughs> Oops. Here it is. Tout malade, tout couché dans les grandes fossés. Banane sans tout pourri, couché côté de l'évé d'égo. Et mon désert, quoi il n'a Les gosses sont tout malades, tout touchés dans les grands fossés. Et là-bas dans les magasins, à pousser des bananes. Les bananes sont tout pourries, tout touchés dans les grands fossés. Des gosses, quoi il n'a Oh, des gosses, quoi il n'a Les gosses sont tout malades, touchés dans les grands fossés. Galopé dans les magasins, j'ai touché des vieux bananes. Les bananes sont tout pourries, tout couché quand elles dégoûtent. Dégoûtent, quoi il n'a, dégoûtent en tout mal. And so, that's the first thing we heard. I'd never heard anything like that. And I'm going to fast forward toward the end of it. Les bananes, tout couché quand elles dégoûtent. Dégoûtent, dégoûtent, dans les coins, ça passe à l'air. Quoi il n'a, mon cher ami, quoi il n'a. A guy named Wilfred Charles from somewhere here in New Iberia 
sing, re being recorded singing the first time that expression was recorded. <laughs> Turns out um, that uh, it was also uh, maybe the first time the word rock was recorded. Rockaway, Rockaway, maybe a, the first time that the term rock was recorded uh, in uh, in association with music uh, right here in Louisiana once again. And why is that important? Well, well, it because people kept doing it. <laughs> Sister Sally brought that little brother Lee John is dead. Sister Sally brought that new brother Lee John is dead. She came a knocking on my door. Brother Lee John is dead. She put that letter in my hand. Brother Lee John is dead. Lord, 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 Lord. Brother Lee John is dead. Rock away, rock away. Brother Lee John is dead. The point is that this old stuff that was coincidentally recorded, thankfully, uh, back in the 30s, uh, continues to serve as a inspiration, as as a source for uh, what's happening. Some of the most exciting stuff that's happening today in uh, Louisiana music. Uh, here's a. Uh, one of those songs that the Hoffbauer sisters were singing in their yard on Hopkins Street when Alan heard it. Se donne rendez-vous, amusez-vous, faites les fous, car c'est pour vous le plaisir du jeune âge. Colline et collin, s'aimait à la folie, vont tenir pour la vie, ne revenez demain. Hélas, ce qu'on appelle, pour célébrer la fête, qu'on est musette, tambour de tambourin, c'est aujourd'hui la fête printanière. And 
And may maybe one of the most amazing uh, recycling uh, projects to come out of uh, this new Iberia music, <coughs> the Segura brothers, who are from right nearby in uh, White Oak, uh, between here and Avery Allen. Uh, Ada Segura sang uh, this song, which is really. <laughs> Really raw, old time, down in the down in the ditch, bl gut bucket blues song. song about a <coughs> guy who's being buried, a, a criminal who's being buried, and he says, three days after I'm gone, you come and sit at the cross of my tomb, talking to the woman who put him there. Wayne Toops heard that, and... <laughs> My priest tells me there's no use to confess anymore. I have the blues. Look at here. I'm being put in the grave for the rest of eternity. of a rosary pass in front of my eyes. To mount the gallows of eternity to be hanged. Man, there's a children's song. <laughs> anyway, uh, my point again is that uh, all of this old stuff that was happily, thankfully captured uh, by people like Alan Lomax and, and generously donated back to us, repatriated, made available, put back into circulation, and it got all of this old stuff gets turned into new stuff, uh, thanks to um, the amazing, rich, cultural, musical tradition uh, that was found here, I among other places, but here in New Iberia and Iberia Parish. Thanks. Are there any questions? or? Comment, you believe all that? <laughs> yes. Uh, I've heard the Cordillon, but uh, the song you said. Zarico Pasale. Yeah, what does that mean? Uh, it, well, <coughs> I got another hour. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, is that, literally, it means the snap beans ain't salty. And we've often wondered what in the world, why were they singing about snap beans, green beans, but not being salty? Who cares, right? Well, it turns out that there's way more to it than that. Uh, the, the, when they were singing this in French, uh, the term zarico, which has come to mean, come to refer to the music that is played by a lot of people in South Louisiana, uh, <coughs> it sounded a lot like string beans, but it also, if, if you look back to where these people came from uh, originally in West Africa, uh, it had to do with um, courtship rituals and music and dance that were associated with courting. That has a lot more, it, it's pr much more likely that it has something to do with that, but uh, without getting into it, uh, Zydeco turns out to be not only a noun, string beans, 
And every time you would ask those Zydeco musicians about this, they'd say, what do we do? What is Zydeco? And they'd say, oh, that's beans. <laughs> they'd always say, <laughs> you know, laugh about it. It's like, if you believe that, that's all I'm telling you. But, but if you listen to the way they was used, they'd say, oh, Zydeco tu la nuit. We're going to Zydeco all night long. It's a verb. So it means da to dance. I, I didn't mean to give you too much of a complicated thing, but it means to dance, to court, to, it's the music that you dance to, it's the, uh, the event that you go to to dance, uh, uh, all of that all together. And Wilford Charles, in that first recording you heard, tries to explain it, tries to send us down a side road. He says, pas mis de la viande, pas mis à rien, juste des haricots dans la chaudière. Got no salt meat in the pot, so the beans ain't salty. Okay. I think he was playing with us, but anyway, that's, what the, that's what's in the song. Anybody else? Man, y'all are a, either a very nice crowd or a gullible or I don't know. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your kind attention. And uh, I, hope, uh, I hope I helped you uh, be a little bit more proud of the place you come from. <laughs>